great. There's not so many people this evening, but it's nice to see the elite have come for this talk. The A-list. Is that correct? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Call yourself the A-list. You know, a lot of times when you give praise, you try to lift people up. It's amazing how often people just refuse to be lifted up. You can't be talking to me. Ajahn Brahm, your eyesight must have gone. That I'm just an ordinary person. I've never yet seen an ordinary person in my life. Because you look at people, some of you I've known for such a long time, and look at everybody's. I'm not saying this, I'm not just making it up. It's just really special and kind and lovable. It's one of the reasons why when, one of the things I just again returned from overseas on Thursday morning, it's only yesterday, goodness gracious. <laughs> but some of the things which inspire me, and I hope it inspires you, is some of the feedback which you get when you go overseas. A, one example which I really found just so moving was about this person who said that you know, she was going through a very difficult separation, a divorce. That does happen to people. And through that divorce, you know, she came and said, you know, the talks which she'd listened online from here was what saved her life. And she was going through that real separation now in the courts. And if you, I, hopefully you've never gone through that, hopefully you never have to go through that. But if you do go through that, you know, the separation, someone you've chosen to live with and have a kid with and just give your whole life to, when it all goes sour. And one of the things which I told her, which you know, she promised to do and which was very helpful, please don't blame one another. Don't think it's your own fault or somebody else's fault. Because sometimes this happens in life. It's like nature. If ever you get sick, how many of you have been sick over the last 12 months? Can you blame yourself for that? Is it your fault? You didn't eat the right food, you didn't exercise, you should have taken more rest, you should have come to the Buddhist Society of Western Australia and done some meditation retreats. <laughs> it's so easy to blame. But, I don't do much exercise except my 10 push-ups every morning. I don't walk that far. And my diet, if you see it, isn't this true, Venerable Sumito? You can't call it a healthy diet. But I'm always in good health. <laughs> Other monks are living with me, so that's really unfair, Ajahn Brahm. You eat all sorts of rubbish and that you're so healthy. And other people, they work hard and they do all sorts of exercise and take this probiotic and antibiotic and some biotic or symbiotic, sorry, I meant to say. I don't know how many biotics there are, but anyway. <laughs> and actually, I'm you just eat sausages. <laughs> but then sometimes I kind of wonder why. You know, what is one of the most important parts of good health for you? One of them is like the attitude of mind. And like you're going through a painful time like a separation, a divorce. What is your attitude of mind when this happens? It's so easy to blame somebody. It's so easy to say it's your fault. But a lot of people, women and men, because that's one of the things you do, you talk to people, they all feel that they're to blame. And if they see their partner, they say, no, they're to blame. They always like blaming people. Why on earth do you do that? It's like sometimes you blame the climate because it's a hot day. But I did notice it was hot yesterday, but with a bit of meditation, it's cooled down today. Is that Ajahn Brahm bringing back some English weather? <laughs> <laughs> back here to Perth. Who knows, maybe. But anyway, I do know 
remember Buddhist climate control? I usually tell this to people over in uh, Serpentine, in the monastery. How do Buddhists deal with climate control? It's very, very easy. When it's hot, like the last few days, what do you do? You keep a cool head. I've noticed many people, they keep complaining, oh, it's hot today, oh, it's terrible today, oh, I'm going to fry my brain today, why can't I have an air con right in front of me, why can't we have a fridge and I go and live in it, why can't we move closer to the Arctic Circle, Antarctic Circle, sorry, I'm in the Southern Hemisphere now, why can't we get some of these ships and drag an iceberg into, <laughs> into Perth? Would you like that? But people think so much, that makes them more hot than the weather outside. So keep a cool head when it gets hot. It's hot, but it's not that bad. What was that story? That story of these two Australian men. And because, you know, they used to go to the pub and get drunk and they were just pretty selfish, that when they died, they appeared in this hell realm. It's really hot down there. But they were always, you know, have positive attitudes. At the end of their life, they came to this place, our Buddhist center, and learned a few good attitudes in life, like not complaining, not blaming. So they were quite happy working together. I used to start working up in karate. You know, in the mines it's warm, yeah, but it's good pay. So this heavenly bell's devilish being decided to teach them a lesson, turn the temperature up. I said, oh wow, this is even better. The amount of penalty rates we get working at such a temperature makes it all worthwhile. We make so much more money in this. So this little devil got more frustrated and turned the temperature up even further. And I said, oh wow, this is really good. It's like being in one of these a city nightclubs and dancing in the hot weather, even though I'm already sweating enough, this is really good fun. And this little devil is supposed to be torturing people in the hell realm. I don't believe in hell realms, but this is just part of the joke, okay? <laughs> Started saying, these Western Australians are so difficult to deal with. I know what I'll do. I'll turn down the temperature and make it freezing. And as soon as they turned down the temperature and there was ice and cold everybody, everywhere, these two Western Australians were dancing up and down for joy and punching the air with happiness. He said, I don't know how to deal with these Western Australians. Look, it was really hot and you were happy. And now I turned it really cold and you're even more happy. How come? And these Western Australians said, we always knew that hell would freeze over before Fremantle won the, 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 <laughs> won the Premier League. Go Fremantle, they must have won. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so anyway, I kind of like that story because it was a positive attitude no matter what happens. You can always see the best part of it. And the same in any difficulty you have in your life, such as, you know, you have a problems in your relationship together. See the meaning in it. There's always a positive side to everything. So, if you have to get separated, don't blame your partner. See the meaning in it. You've learned something. And who knows? Maybe like this one guy who went to Thailand years ago and some person, he stole his guitar. This monk really liked playing the guitar. He was actually quite good. He actually did a record on the guitar, never got anywhere, but he still managed to cut a record. And he loved his guitar so much, but then in some sort of cheap hotel somewhere in Thailand, someone stole it. He was so devastated. But then afterwards, that gave him the freedom to become a monk. Oh, thank you, whoever that thief was. I always said, always show gratitude towards that thief. Thank you for what you did. If you didn't steal my guitar, I couldn't have become a monk. So remember, even if you are single, see something positive in it, what you've learned. Don't blame anybody. It's part of life to learn, to learn and grow. 
just like uh, coming back from UK, what I learned is just, oh, what a long way it is. All the way from London, all the way to Perth. So when I arrived, I was so jet lagged that you know that I have a main meal of the day at 11 o'clock over in Serpentine. I just told the monks, I'll just take a quick nap. I'll see you back down here at 10.30 for the arms round and lunch. I slept through it. I didn't have any lunch that day. I was knocked out. Hungry in the afternoon, but much more rested. That's, that's um, jet lag. But what happened? You know, just, was that just a rotten thing to do, to have to go all over the world and come, down so come back so exhausted? And I said, no. There's always meaning in each one of these little events in your life. And one of the meanings was all the wonderful people which I met on the journey. Even the first person I met, so I've never seen them before, over in Heathrow. They looked at me and said, you know that she was actually from Adelaide. I don't know if she's listening today. She said to an elderly lady, she said, I'm a Quaker. Are you Buddhist? I said, yeah, I'm a Buddhist. And she said, you know, I read one of the best books of my life. It's supposed to be written by a Buddhist monk. And I got interested. <laughs> and he said, he wrote this story of the, the cow that cried. Remember that story? I think I mentioned that about one of the last talks I gave here. He said, that was one of the most beautiful stories I ever heard about this prisoner over in Carnet Prison Farm, one of the prisons over in Australia, who was actually converted to being uh, a vegetarian, non-violent by, did I tell that story last time I was here? Yeah, okay, you know it. By this cow who came to be slaughtered, looked him in the eye, and just the cow cried. He said, that changed his whole life. He was a murderer, he confessed that to me before. And he said, that was the most beautiful story. And he said, I can't remember the name of the author. I said, well, no, was, it, was it Ajahn Brahm? <laughs> he said, yeah, that's him. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> and just when you're sitting next to somebody like that, it makes a lot of difference. Even in the airport on the way back, there was one of the ladies there who says she comes here every Friday evening. She says she'll come in this evening. Are you here? The lady there put this in the um, duty-free lounge? No. Maybe coming on Saturday or something. Anyway, it's amazing to sort of the, the happiness which I get when you talk to such people and you've actually done something for them. People who, whose lives have been touched and healed because of some of these things which are said on a Friday night, Saturday or Sunday over in this Nolamara temple. It gives meaning to my life. And when you were asked the question uh, on the last night over in London, was a lady was asking about, as Buddhists, she said, how do we react to the TV uh, graphic images of people being killed and being blown up in these war zones of the world, you know, such as over in uh, Palestine and Israel and Ukraine. He said, I feel a tension there. Sometimes I feel I have to look at it because if I don't look at it, it's just like being stupid and I'm not caring for others. But every time I look at it and see it, it just really gives me sleepless nights. And of course, as a monk, you don't have TV. But I can see some images on the internet, and they're pretty gross. And these aren't just everybody, these are some even little kids who haven't got a clue, can't tell the difference between uh, a person born in Russia or Ukraine, can't tell the difference between a Jew and Muslim or, or a Catholic or a Buddhist or anybody. They're just kids. You know, then they get blown up and killed, and parents get blown up. How do you deal with that? I know one thing, you may think I'm more sanguine than most, don't react like most, because I was conditioned, very much conditioned, by the after effects of the Second World War. 
I was born in 1951 in London. And I still remember, you know, going past some of what they call the bomb sites. These were buildings which had been totally blown up, hundreds of them. They hadn't repaired them yet, hadn't rebuilt them. And there's so many people died there. I remember asking my my mother and grandmother what it was like during the Second World War, because they were in London during the Blitz. My grandfather was a fire warden. I don't know what he sort of saw, but he was such a kind man, my grandfather. And my mother apparently was in a terraced house in Acton, that's the area where I grew up, in a terraced house, and the neighbor, a bomb hit the neighbor's house, you know, you know from the sky and it was direct hit, and the friends you would play with, the neighbors, were all uh, instantly killed. And the house where my mother was, and my grandma, that was just blown apart. They survived. And I remember my mother, and she, she didn't remember this, she probably blocked it out, but apparently her whole arm was lacerated by the flying glass. But they survived. And how my grandma used to deal with it, I always remember this. Every time there was a thunderstorm over that part of London, and the lightning boomed and cracked, it would bring back the memories of that episode during the Second World War. And whatever she was doing, she would stop and go and sit on the stairs. It was a second story flat she was living in. She would sit there because she was taught as a young woman, that was the safest place in the house. In wooden houses, the stairs were made of uh, mostly um, stone, so they were tougher. So that's where she would sit. And after the thunderstorm had passed, she'd come back and join us. That was her way of dealing with it. It may not be the standard way, but that was the way which worked for her. And I always remember that. What works for you may not be how, what works for others, but you find that way of dealing with the problems of life. One of the biggest difficulties was giving those experiences which you have to face in life, giving them meaning. Often we ask, why does this happen? Why does this happen to me? Why in all the years that human beings have been on this earth, why do we still have wars? Why do we still have divorces? Why do we still have sicknesses? Why do we, can't we live together in peace and harmony? Sometimes we learn. A lot of times we don't. Not the first time. Maybe the next time we learn some more. To learn how to be more forgiving, more understanding, more embracing of one another. And one of the stories which I said at this last talk, which I remember somebody showing me a clip video clip of a movie about Mahatma Gandhi. Don't know whether this was a valid and historically accurate, but in this particular part of the movie, I think Gandhi was going through a fast or something, and one of his supporters, an uh, Indian Hindu, came up to him and said, just, I don't like this being peaceful. You don't know what it feels like when your own son is murdered. You know, by, in this case, he said, by Muslims. And he said, you talk about peace. Give me some understanding why and what I should do when I still feel this grief so deeply. And what Gandhi said, you've lost a son. There are many children in this area who've got no fathers or mothers adopt one. It doesn't matter who you adopt, if you're a Hindu, please bring him up as a Muslim. <laughs> when I remember hearing that, I thought I'd never forget that. What a beautiful piece of advice that was. Don't just say, I forgive you. Do something more. Muslims killed your son. Go and find a Muslim orphan and bring him up as a Muslim. Devout. Oh, that was beautiful. You know, at this point I also mentioned, because sometimes I get a bit too serious. So Sometimes I remember there was a, a disciple, a follower over in Singapore. 
she's a Buddhist, she's married to a Christian, they've got two children, one's a Hindu, the other one's a, was it a Christian, yes right, they've got four of the main religions. And to this day, whenever I see them, I said, look, when are you going to have another kid? You've got to bring the up, up the fifth kid as a Jew. <laughs> then you've got the full set. Like when I used to play poker as a kid, the full house. <laughs> and that's not being stupid, I think. That's one of the ways that we can somehow overcome the distrust we have for the other, whoever that other happens to be. One of the words of, you know, the other, it came, it was said so often when I was over in UK recently. Because in UK, Venerable Chanda, who I was going to support, you know, for the Bikuni project over there, that she was staying in Oxford. And you all know that I went to university. Where did I go to university? No, not Oxford, no in what they call in Oxford, the other place. <laughs> <laughs> they never mention the word Cambridge in Oxford, it's always the other place. <laughs> and I thought, ah, now that's the meaning of wars. Where we have our place and the other place. Or, you know, Theravada Buddhism and the other sect. <laughs> our gender and the other gender. That's where we get the wars of discrimination from. You know one of the things I used to notice over in Thailand, I know I lived there for nine years, it was a different culture than where I grew up. You know, the English culture, European culture, Australian culture, you know, American culture is pretty much all the same. They've got differences. But when you went to like an indi uh, a culture in Thailand which had never been colonized. They had some of the ways of doing things which I thought was really interesting. I learned so much just by seeing a different culture. I know one of the important things I saw there was the beauty and importance of family. I've said this before here. Please, any of you who want to buy a house, please buy a small one. And have all the kids and grandparents living in one or two bedrooms. They have to get on together. This is my, I think, said this before. My parents were poor, legitimately poor. I know people say this as a matter of pride. And I can understand why now. Because my parents were poor. I, I always have to um, share a room with my brother, who I went to see when I was over in UK. Wouldn't miss that opportunity. Because we stayed in the same room, yeah, we fought kids growing up. Yeah, I was a Buddhist. He was a banker. <laughs> he told me that when he became a banker and a bank manager, he never let on that his brother over in Australia was a Buddhist monk. He thought that was bad for his career prospects. <laughs> it wasn't at all, but it was a bit weird in those days to be a Buddhist monk. But now <laughs> But nevertheless, we had to grow up in the same room. Yeah, we'd fight, just like you see kangaroos. You know, two male joeys, they would fight over in the forest. It's just like a boy thing, I don't know why, but there it is. So, but nevertheless, because we're in the same room, we had to get on. There was no escape. So after a while, we just, you know, learned to love each other instead of fighting. And I thought if we could put so many people in the same room, if in your house, if you can put you know, all the kids not in, you know, in their own room, why not share a room? Eventually you have to share a room when you get married, you find a partner in life, why not learn how to share a room now? You know, with your kids, your grandparents, goodness knows who else. You learn so much more when there's not so much separation. You learn about the other, whoever the other happens to be. And you respect the other, instead of just thinking, those people outside of Cambridge, they're the other side. Don't talk about them. 
So what we're doing there is we're learning solutions to problems in life. Learning how to respect one another, even though they're so different. I think maybe one of the places I learned that more than anywhere else was, thank you. <laughs> was that really a fart? It certainly sounded like one. <laughs> it wasn't me, I, I'm, I'm innocent. You know, sometimes I get frustrated because people said, you shouldn't say that word, Ajahn Brahm. Why not? Everyone else says it. <laughs> it's something I rebel against. I remember going to, going to church, uh, an Anglican church, when I was young. And I saw the vicar. He would never say any word like fart. <laughs> it was not done. <laughs> the only reason... <laughs> The only reason why I went to a church in those days was really boring sermons. But nevertheless, I went there. You know why? I actually had a good voice when I was young. I was in the school choir and even selected to sing at the Royal Albert Hall once. That's a big time, the Royal Albert Hall. Of course, there's about 3,000 other kids with me, so they couldn't really hear my bad voice or whatever I had. But nevertheless, because you're in the school choir, you get in the church choir. And even though I didn't believe a word of what I was singing, it was a nice little earner for me. I was only about nine or ten years of age. No, maybe that's wrong. About ten or eleven years of age. Had a nice sweet voice. Looked really, you know, cute as a little kid just growing up. And one of the things you could do if you were in the church choir you could volunteer for the wedding ceremonies. And I loved those wedding ceremonies. I soon learned, I was a smart kid, and I soon learned to when you were in the singing at the marriage, you'd always look at the bride, not the guy, the bride. Always look at her and smile. <laughs> and you look so cute on purpose because they would give you tips afterwards. And that was my main source of income <laughs> as a 10-year-old kid. And my father and mother never knew anything about it. I just told them, Dad, I'm going to church today. Oh, okay. I didn't realize it was <laughs> for financial reasons, nothing else. But what I <laughs> I shouldn't say these things, but nevertheless, that's how I grew up, necessity. But at least you could actually listen a little bit and find out what other people were teaching. There was a couple here years ago who were, uh, they're both still alive, they're a bit, bit old now. She was a Thai, he was Italian. And so she dragged him to our temple. He wasn't really interested in Buddhism at all at first. But he said, we're married. My wife is a Thai Buddhist. I am an Italian Catholic. What should we do? for the sake of peace and harmony in our relationship. And this wasn't me, this was a monk who was here before me, Ajahn Chakra. He gave this wonderful piece of advice. You know, that you follow different religions. So you, uh, Italian sort of husband, you let your wife come to our Buddhist temple every Saturday. And you must come with her. And you, wife, Thai Buddhist, you go to the Catholic Church on a Sunday with your husband. So you do things together rather than apart. Yeah, you're different religions, different understandings, but you can learn. You know, you Italian husband can learn why your wife does what she does and how she thinks and just her culture, her understandings of life. And you, wife, can understand how your husband thinks by going to the Catholic Church. Go together. It doesn't mean you just have to follow that religion. You can go there and just learn. And just that by itself is like being kind. It's one of the things which, maybe I've gone too far on this, I'm not sure how you feel, but I do remember when I first came over here to uh, Australia, realizing that's an important part to make Buddhism 
welcome in Australia, not just by having your own little enclave of just Buddhists and only Buddhists and nothing else but Buddhists, not just Buddhists but Theravada Buddhists, not Mahayana Buddhists, not Tibetan Buddhists, just Theravada, not just Theravada Buddhists, forest tradition, only forest tradition, nothing else but forest tradition, not just forest tradition, only follows the Vajan Chara, nothing else but follows the Vajan That's where you get sectarianism and arguments and misunderstandings. So I just said it would be wonderful to be much more eclectic. So I honestly went out of my way, this is actually true, to actually make those relations with people of other religions. And especially, I must say, because it's probably the biggest congregation in, Aust in Perth at that time, the Anglican Church, and so much good fun with that going to Anglican Church. I didn't believe in their philosophies, but I believed in their kindness. And you know this place here you're sitting in right now, this used to be the car park of the Nolamara Anglican Church. The, the actual church was now used as our community hall. And when we found this place, we thought this would be a nice place to develop and turn into a Buddhist center. We could afford the fee to buy it, but then we had the, well this was consecrated before, and so they had to have a meeting in Perth. Is it okay to sell this place to the Buddhists? You know what they said? The Buddhists have always been helping us. Why can't we help them? So they very happily agreed to sell this place to us. So you're sitting right now in the car park of an Anglican church in the past. So your bum is consecrated. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm only exaggerating. <laughs> but because of that, I think many of you remember this, I know that Eddie remembers this, sitting at the back, that when, because we were always very kind to them and they were kind to us, we learned some little harmony together, what we did was to, uh, that's John Shepherd, wasn't it? He was a dean at the time, he said, you know, you give good talks, why don't you come and give a talk at our cathedral over in St. George's Terrace, St. George's Cathedral. And I said, well, why not? So, I forget what year that was, but quite a, so quite a few years ago, yeah. Full House. But apparently this was the first time ever in the history of the world. I like exaggerating a bit, but I think it's pretty true. <laughs> <laughs> that a non-Christian gave the Sunday sermon at a full Eucharist in a cathedral. Was that true, Drew? <laughs> no, I'm a believer. <laughs> Why not? But anyway. <laughs> Anyway, it was really good fun, because there's a few people here, I think they've passed away now. They were ex-policemen, really big, and they said they'd been trained, you know, in you know, martial arts. He said, you're going into the cathedral, Ajahn Brahm, and that might be a dangerous place for a heretic like you. So we're going, <laughs> we're going there to protect you. You have secret security. But of course you didn't need it. One of the amazing things there was so many people came and I didn't know who was a Buddhist and who was a Christian. Of course many of you I could see and say, oh yeah, you come to our centre here. Many I didn't know who they were. Maybe you were Christians, maybe I just didn't see you properly. But it was a full house, really full packed. And then these, these evangelicals came in, charging that the Dean of St George's Cathedral he was as much a heretic as I was, and he's going to go to hell for this, you know what they usually say. But then those were thrown out of the church. The Buddhists were allowed to stay. They were thrown out, and the doors were slammed against them. If that was in a Buddhist temple, I'd say, no, come in, open the door of your <laughs> heart and your temple. But nevertheless, it was kind of electric, 
in there, not because of our beliefs, but the fact that we can listen to one another and create some more harmony in this world. Have you ever thought that your partner is wrong? They just don't understand that you've given up so much and now that if you forgive now and don't blame them, that's almost being dishonest. Do you ever think that the other side, whoever the other side is, is really wrong and cruel and mean and nasty and they need to be wiped off the face of the earth? Do you ever feel like that's what wars are? Now, how can we stop wars? You know one thing, I always mention this, this is quite the wrong time because we have no elections coming up soon, I think. In, because I remember history, in ancient Rome, whenever there was an election, what did they call the people standing for election? They use the same word these days, it comes from a Latin word, candidates. Candidate from an election, why do they call it that word? I did study Latin at school. I hated it. What did I say before that what was scratched into the, the, one of the desks where I had to sit to listen to Latin? Latin is a language as dead as dead could be. First it killed the Romans, now it's killing me. <laughs> <laughs> and that was accurate. You felt, <laughs> what am I learning Latin for? But one of the things you learn, that many of the words which we speak now have got Latin roots and candida is one of them. The word candid means white. Because anyone who was standing for election would show that they were standing for election as a senator by wearing white clothes. And they wear white the same way like a woman wears white at a wedding. Why do women have a white wedding dress? A sign of purity. So why do guys wear a dark suit? <laughs> I'll, I'll let you answer that. I get into much <laughs> trouble as it is. That's why Mark's wear brown, because it's kind of in between. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So they were white because it was a sign of their purity. As, as part of, they were elected on not what they promised to do in the future, but what they'd done in the past. Their efficiency in sort of uh, virtue and wisdom to be able to solve problems and find solutions for them. Never for what they promised in the future. And that's one of our big mistakes in society. We have an election, people promise the oh, whole world and get rid of the problems and exterminate the pests, no matter what those pests are. And I don't mean the real pests, the real pests don't do much harm. And sometimes you think, what is a pest? <laughs> what was your answer, what do you think? <laughs> oh, that person, that person, my wife, my kids, my well, I don't know. Don't ever think like that. So, <laughs> instead of doing stuff like that, not what they promised to do in the future. What have they done in the past? Have they shown by what they've done that they are competent leaders who can find solution, can bind people together and actually make for a better world? Who has ever selected to be sort of like a surgeon? Is it because that they've shown in the past they've got lots of skills? Or is it for other reasons? And sometimes, oh, just, it's interesting traveling because you listen and learn to a lot of different ways of doing things. And one of the events which, when I was visiting San Francisco some years ago, really disappointed me. And it really quite deeply disappointed me. And that was where in San Quentin jail at the time, there was this young man who was leader of one of the big gangs which had done so many crimes and murders as well as thefts and drug dealing over in San Francisco. He'd been caught, tried, very easily found guilty of the crimes. He was the leader of one of the gangs. 
and sentenced to death. But it takes a long time from a sentence to actually the execution. And so in that time, you know, he was, he had so much respect, you know, from the gangs, because he was quite strong and violent. And he decided to try and turn that respect he had and the wisdom of experience to try and stop many other kids getting sucked into the gangs of San Francisco. So he was allowed to counsel some of these young gang members and get them off that path and into another way of life which was more meaningful, less dangerous. And he was so highly successful in this. Not just because of his wisdom, his understanding, because he'd actually been there and experienced it, because his way of communicating with others, he was a natural leader. So apparently, that so many other kids who could, you know, just were almost in the middle of getting involved in such crimes, he managed to keep away from cr crime. He was an effective counsellor. He hadn't been to any university, just the life he'd been leaving, living. But he was very effective. And many kids were being turned away from a life of crime to something far more meaningful. So there was a big petition while I was there, just only visiting for a week or two. Please commute his death sentence. If you really think he should be in jail, just keep him in jail, but just let him counsel. He's doing so much incredible good in stopping these other people joining gangs. But unfortunately, the governor of California at the time was this person called Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know what he said? It's a gross thing he said. He said that's a girly thing to do. To, f to not carry out the death sentence. So this kid was executed. And I thought, why do people do that? This kid was doing something good with his life. It's a really rotten thing he'd done in the past, but why punish him now? He was actually doing something which no one else could do. Healing things which no one else could heal. Just because of his rare upbringing. So please. But of course that was too late. Poor kid got, I think, electrocuted at the time. Was it electrocuted? I'm not quite sure. Lethal injection. But anyhow, <laughs> that's how we stop wars. You know, sometimes there are people who just wherever they come from, whoever they are, whatever their background is, why can't we just, and if you need to keep them in jail, well, I don't really believe in jails, but nevertheless, if that's what people think, but don't waste that resource of someone who can really connect with others and teach them and lead them to a much better way of life. Unfortunately, when people believe in punishment and blame, that creates more problems. It's one of the reasons why, when I told that lady going through a, a painful divorce, please don't blame yourself and don't blame your husband. She had enough confidence and trust in me. She said, okay, I will do that. It's a hard thing to do. But when you let that happen, you don't need to be the executioner. Karma takes care of things. So that means you don't have to have a bad mind. I also mentioned that over in recently, it was about a year ago, someone pointed me to the story of this lady over in Europe, I think over in Austria, and she, when she was young, she had a sister, a twin. I thought I could hear something ringing. Was that the ice cream man? <laughs> <laughs> On a hot day, has someone ordered ice cream for everybody? <laughs> but anyhow, let's get serious again. Because she had a sister, a twin, and they were Jewish, and they were put in Auschwitz together. This is not a joke, this is a wonderful story. 
when not at the beginning it was terrible, but it turned out to be something which inspired me. And when they were in Auschwitz together, uh, they were experimented on because they were twins, biological twins, identical twins. And her sister got most of the terrible treatment and was killed. She had a terrible time too, but survived. And you can imagine the hatred which you grow up with when you don't know who's a, what religion, doesn't really matter when you're a young kid. That was your sister, someone you love, and they were treated so badly, and you were treated badly too. So she was carrying that hatred for most of her life. And then apparently, I don't know how she found this, but when she was, I think, in South America, she saw someone who looked and actually was one of the doctors or assistants who was in Auschwitz torturing her. And so she got his address and sent him this letter, you have to come to Auschwitz to meet me. I was one of your victims. And he was so scared, he had, and he also was you know, suffering a lot too, knowing what he had done, and knowing he was now found out. So apparently he went to Auschwitz, and this was you know, only a couple of years ago, to meet this woman. You can imagine how frightened he was. What would she do? But when they met in Auschwitz, she just told him, it was terrible what you did, and just how my sister suffered and died. But from this moment on, I forgive you. I have no hatred left. So please understand that I bear you no ill will, and I forgive. And when she wrote about that afterwards, and you know, sometimes we think, how can you forgive someone? But she did it. And she wrote this wonderful little article saying forgiveness is a choice, a free choice. You can always make. You don't always have to bear that blame or that anger towards someone who did some terrible, terrible, terrible things. You have a choice not to. And that just word, choice, you can forgive. And at that, she wrote, when you take that choice, that option, which is free for you to take, it turns you from being a victim to being a victor. You don't have to carry on wars of revenge and hatred, blow them up, because they take, took my son. Kill them because they killed my relations, my father, my mother. You know that if you have those sorts of attitudes, we'll always have wars in this world. Divorces, separation, fights. And there's something inside of you that says, why does this always have to be that way? You do have a choice. Please use it, the wise choice of forgiveness and understanding what we all share in common. When I bleed, my blood is red too, not brown. <laughs> Same as when you bleed, your tears are as salty as mine. So please, I don't care if you're a man, woman, LGBT, I always get this confused, LGBTQIA+, I try and say it too fast, I don't care who you are, actually I do care, no matter who you are, so actually to try and bring people together and have a life where everybody who comes into this place feels welcome, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. No blaming, no judging. That's the kind of Buddhist center, Buddhist society I always want to develop. And in our committee, we have a committee meeting on Sunday, 
uh, I'm not allowed to vote, but I do have a veto, and I'll veto anything <laughs> which is discriminatory. Thank you for listening. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I'll come and do it properly. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> you know, sometimes when you do things half heartedly, if you're going to say sadhu, just give it everything you've got. Okay. That's what Ajahn Chah told me. Whatever you do, give it everything you've got. So when you pass the donation box, give it everything you've got. <laughs> No, I shouldn't say that, but I did. Okay, so questions from the floor before questions from the machine. Any questions? Okay, let's get the machine. Oh, you've got Eddie. Eddie question. Okay. Okay. Ajahn Brahm. Yes. Yeah. That is me. So is that your question? <laughs> yes. Am I a spitting image of Ajahn Brahm? <laughs> Ajahn, you, you talk about um, our well-being. Yeah. Harmony and yep. the walls, you know. Yeah. yeah. I want to ask you, Ajahn Brahm, you know. Yes. Don't you think, Ajahn Brahm, like life, you know, generally life outside, okay, it's full of suffering, you know. It's suffering? It has lots yeah. and lots and lots of suffering. Yeah. It's also got Just these be moment. beautiful moments as well. Yeah, it's a, I think, okay. But being Buddhist, you know, especially a practicing Buddhist, okay, the Buddha has given us a lot of tools now, okay? Rules. To look inwards, okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. To make ourselves peaceful. Yes, but it's also not just the tools which are given to make us peaceful. Mm. It's the responsibility we have for others as well. Mm. I know that sometimes people will say, you're a Hinayana Buddhist. Hinayana Buddhists were supposed to just think of themselves. Mahayana Buddhists only think of others. Both are wrong. You know the answer, it's, and those weddings. You look at the wife, now you're married, you must never think of yourself anymore. Husband, you must not think of yourself. Mm. Husband, you must not think of your wife from this moment on. Those are the ones which I love, because it confuses people. <laughs> husband, you must not think of your wife from this day on. Wife, you must never think of your husband from this day on. Mm. Once you're married, you must only think of us. Mm -hmm. Hinayana Buddhists, you must never think of others. Mm -hmm. Mahayana Buddhists, you must never think of yourself. Both mm -hmm. of you, you must think of us. Mm -hmm. You're in this world together. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people think, I am selfish. I just mm -hmm. stay in my hut for a few days, do a retreat. A lot of the time I work my butt off instead of sitting on it, mm -hmm. just uh, serving others. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they ask, Ajahn Brahm, are you Mahayana Buddhist? You know, you're just going with setting up a nuns monastery over in uh, UK right now. You find out, out about it on the web. Mm -hmm. And also at the same time, you just, uh, aren't you supposed to be just being in Australia, just meditating? We've got a nice cave for you over in Serpentine. Why not use it? You share. Mm -hmm. It's about all of us. Mm -hmm. So, old story. What type of Buddhism do I follow? It's, it's Hinayana, Mahayana and Vajrayana. H from Hinayana, Aha from Mahayana, Yana from Vajrayana, which spells? Ahayana, yeah. That's my tradition. <laughs> I tell silly jokes. Why not? <laughs> Good fun. You know that sometimes people don't laugh at my jokes, but I always laugh at my jokes. There's always someone who laughs, and that's usually me. What I learned in England, I'll just tell this quickly. Because England's a very posh place. Especially if you go to some place like you know, Oxford, you know, to give talks over there. So there was this upper class British lady. She got pregnant, because she was so posh and upper class, that when it came to nine months and she hadn't given birth, they said, oh, just stiff up a lip. It'll be okay, don't complain. So she just, 10 months, she still hadn't given birth. A whole year she hadn't given birth. Two years, she just forgot about it and got on with life. 25 years since getting pregnant, 
You know, she was a bit fat, but they thought she was eating too much or gas or something. <laughs> so after two years, the doctor was suspicious, so gave her a CT scan of her tummy, and they found out the cause why she hadn't given birth yet. Inside her womb were these two fully formed English gentlemen. And one was the gentleman. One was saying to the other, after you, Claude. No, 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 I insist. After you, Percy. No, no, no. After you, Claude. <laughs> if you know English people, sometimes that happens. No, no, after you. No, 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 no. I insist. After you. Okay, a silly joke, yeah, but I laughed, and some of you laughed think it was well, good. Yes? Um, my question, Arjun Brown, is around um, control and non-control when it comes to meditation. So oh, yes. specifically in when you're feeling suffering or going through stress, Yeah. and when it's appropriate to actually say that this is unnatural stress versus natural stress. Uh, okay. I would say that all stress is pretty natural. Okay. So don't control. Control makes more stress. Look, sometimes, like I've had terrible um, jet lag. I haven't slept much at night time. I slept a bit during daytime <laughs> at the wrong times, so I miss my lunch. It's amazing being with you because you give me energy. Usually this time of night, I'll be sort of half asleep. I haven't slept, but how I dealt with things like the stress of not being able to sleep is letting it be, not trying to control it. How can you force yourself to go to sleep? A lot of time that extra stress makes you more awake. It is really clear to me that stress is one of the causes, you know, for illness, which makes it more stressful. So if ever I feel extra hot, extra cold, tired. Now, a lot of times I spend a lot of hours in the last couple of nights just sitting, meditation. Just don't feel that peaceful, but at least I'm not making things worse. And after a couple of days of that, you find you recover so quickly. Don't control, care, let things be. But also be careful of the care strategy, because sometimes leaders in our world one of the problems, they care in the wrong way. You know what care in the wrong way is? I explained this to uh, Leha, who's our ops manager. Care in the wrong way, and to, you heard this as well. What does care in the wrong way mean? Cover ass, retain employment. <laughs> C-A-R-E. That's not caring. That causes a lot of problem in this world. I'd rather be sacked but do the right thing all the time. That makes sense to you? So yeah. Always be kind. Yeah, that makes very much sense. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll get to some of the questions online while there's before people online disappear. How to overcome envy and how to prevent it arising. I've tried mudita but it didn't work. Or maybe I don't know how to practice it. Mudita is celebrating the joy in others or the good success in others. Also practice wisdom as well. I don't know what you envy. Would you really like to be the CEO of a big company? That is so much work. Would you prefer to be the abbot of a Buddhist monastery? That's even more work. Would you like to go traveling overseas? And when you travel overseas, you get jet lagged and tired. Would you like to be, what would you like to be? A lot of times, use wisdom. Do I really want to? Do you like to win the lottery and become very rich? I've known many, many, many very rich people. One guy, I remember, I shouldn't, I don't know, I think he's probably dead by now. He owned a Tropicana company over in Malaysia. I went to his house once to do a blessing for him. And I couldn't believe at the entrance to his house, he had guards, like many people expect. His guards had machine guns. That was incredible. And just, I thought, are they protecting him or is he like in a prison? He couldn't make any difference there. Big 
um, fences all around. He was the one person who was rich, but I thought he was in a prison. He could have whatever he wanted inside his little compound. We had no freedom to go outside and just to walk and mingle with others. Do you envy him? I much prefer being a Buddhist monk. The only prison I have now is I'm too recognizable. I need to have a false beard. <laughs> no, I can't do that against my rules. Anyway, how to practice it? Use wisdom. Do you really want to be somewhere else or like somebody else? Are you happy to be who you are, where you are? Being happy to be who you are is the best. I suffer a lot from the past and I have a hard time following the Noble Eightfold Path due to my mental health issues. Where should I start? Accept your mental health issues. Be strong and say, that's who I am. And number two, don't let people always judge you and say, you are this, you are that. One of my heroes was a Catholic professor. He was the head of schizophrenia when I uh, went to do a talk over in Singapore. And he said, what a wonderful talk I'd given. Can I, can I come and bless his ward? He had a big cross on his chest. I said, but you're a Catholic. He said, yes, but it doesn't matter. I totally agree with what you say. And I asked him, you're in the head of the schizophrenia ward. How do you treat schizophrenia in Singapore? He was a professor, the boss. And he said, I do not treat schizophrenia. Even though I'm the professor, the head of the schizophrenia unit in Woodlands Mental Health Institute in Singapore. I treat the other part of the patient, which isn't schizophrenic. And as soon as I heard that, it just it really hit me deep and I just put my hands up and said, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Well done. Why is it we judge a person, this is your mental health issue, and once we judge them, that's what they become. They become much more of a schizophrenic when you call them a schizophrenic. If somehow or other they can be accepted as who they are, you find whatever illness it is which they've been prescribed at, it gets far less, more moderate. Imagine what it might be like to have an illness, whether it's schizophrenia or ADHD or autism spectrum disorder or Down syndrome. Imagine what it's like when you feel you're not accepted. People don't understand you. You can't be, you know, who you are. That kind of stress is huge. Imagine what it's like being Ajahn Brahma walking down the road in his women's clothes. That's what some people called it. You're wearing a dress, Ajahn Brahma. I make adv I take advantage of that. Right that time, you've heard this story before. Because you know, people said, Ajahn Brahm, why are you wearing this robe for? Why can't you have trousers and shirt and like anybody else? But then at one occasion, you're invited to nothing less than a state dinner with Queen Elizabeth in Parliament House in Canberra. A really you know, A-list meeting. And I remember in, what, in that meeting, I did go to the toilet, everyone has to go to the toilet. And as I was going to the toilet, you know, the next little cubicle, urinal, was uh, Lachlan Murdoch. He was invited too, and I thought, I should have brought some donation envelopes. <laughs> That's true, he was there. Anyhow, so the only reason I got in there, because they had the invitation, had the dress code. This is the dress code story. You have these invitations, you can't just wa walk in. You've got to dress up. And I must admit, honestly, that I remember seeing Queen Elizabeth making her entrance. She had so much jewellery on. It was just sparkling in the lights. But nevertheless, the, sort of, uh, the dress code was black tie. Now look, I've never been for such a long time to formal dinners. I'm a monk. I've been a monk almost 50 years now. And I thought, black tie, what does that mean? I often thought, is that all you wear? 
Is this some kind of perverted dinner? <laughs> Can't you wear trousers? Anyway, I didn't have a black tie, I didn't have any trousers in the monastery. So that was out. The se second choice, military uniform. Oh no way, I'm going to wear military uniform, I'm a pacifist, as you've all heard already. The third choice, the third option, I read it, my eyes went wide, I can go. Long dress. <laughs> I know you've heard that before, but I love that story. So I went as long dress. And I remember turning up at Parliament House in Canberra, and security came out right away and said, are you meant to be here? <laughs> That's what they said. So I got the part, the invitation out, said, here it is, yeah, okay, come in. They hadn't seen a Buddhist monk at one of these dinners before. And it wasn't really a dinner for me. I must give credit for whoever organized this. They did research a Buddhist monk. What could Buddhist monk eat at a state dinner with Queen Elizabeth, the Queen of Australia? Because she represented both countries. So what <laughs> they got me, everybody else on the table had some meat course or something. What they gave me was the first one was cheddar cheese. The second was another type of cheese. It was all really delicious. First time I was just too busy talking to people. And so the, whatever it was, the people serving, they took the plate of cheese away. I said, hey, leave it alone, I'm not finished yet. Don't worry, there's another plate of cheese coming. Really delicious stuff, some of the best cheese I've ever eaten because this was a state dinner for Queen Elizabeth. She didn't have any cheese, just me. <laughs> and the, sec the third course, I just couldn't believe it. Just well done, you've done your research, was dark chocolate. Well, whoever it was who did this actually sculpted it. It was like an amazing work of art, this piece of chocolate. I didn't want to eat it because it would spoil the work of art. I can't really describe it, but they'd melted it in this way and that way, and so it was like a sculpture. It was beautiful. I could only go there because <coughs> I was wearing uh, one of the three choices, <laughs> long dress. <laughs> Anyhow, okay, I better get back to work. I talk too much. <laughs> Mental health issues, where should I start? Just be accepting, open the door of your heart to who you are. Don't try and change yourself. So care for yourself, love yourself. Accept yourself. And hopefully other people can accept you as well. I've seen, I don't know the people you've met, seen so much value and beauty and importance in people with mental health issues. And once you don't judge them, you're not afraid of them, they can open up to you. And it's beautiful what you can do just by being a good friend. Anyway. How does one enter the beautiful breath? I can't seem to let go of all five senses at once. Sound mostly, craving it and grasping at attaining a certain state of mind. That's the most important thing, not to want anything. Your five senses will turn off by themselves. When you go to bed at night, when you go to sleep, and you haven't got jet lag, what do you do? Do you say, I have to get to sleep, I want to get to sleep. Come on, get to sleep. You must sleep. That winds you up so much, there's no way you can sleep. So what you do, you make yourself comfortable. Great way is to um, be mindful, aware of your body. And rest everything. Give so much kindness to your body, everything relaxes. And as for sound, why do you listen to it? It's not your sound. Nothing to do with you. Even, in, many of you have been to my cave, it's tiny. I had my alarm on, I found it was working. The alarm went off when I was in the cave and I just could not hear it because my body decided it needed sleep more than food. That's a rare thing for a monk. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's why I felt fast asleep. Never heard my alarm. So my five senses were totally gone. Try and get a, like a, a sound which doesn't change much. I remember meditating, recently it was a very noisy place. I think, I forget where, but I think it was on a train somewhere, or on a station waiting for the train. And just, in order not to try and block out the noise, but imagine myself in a little bubble, like my cave. When I imagine myself in a bubble, the noise was outside, I was inside. Then the noise soon disappeared. 
vanish. You don't shut down the senses, you use some wise strategies so the senses don't bother you anymore, they're not important. Give them importance and then they'll stay with you. Give them no importance and they vanish. Last question, I am a practicing Buddhist and I have a question about reincarnation that I can't get my head around. Don't worry, you will understand it in your next life. <laughs> okay, so that's the usual joke. Anyway, how does the concept of reincarnation explain population growth? Too many people imagine that the human beings all come from other human beings. That was never part of the Buddhist explanation of rebirth. I told this story over in London, people loved it because this was one of the monks in the northeast of Thailand called uh, Ajahn Thuy. He actually came here a couple of times and in his monastery in the northeast of Thailand it's quite common that somebody, some supporter, saw in the marketplace there was a monkey which was in a small cage. It was like being tortured, you know, not allowed to be free. So he brought the monkey and uh, asked if he could set it free in the forest monastery. At least the monkey could have some space. But this little monkey had never really got used to actually looking after itself. So it would always hang out with the monks. Especially on the afternoon when it came to tea time, you could always see the monkey there, it always have a, a cup of tea in its little paws. drinking tea with the other monks. It obviously associated with the monks and ate food pretty much the same as the monks ate. And it was always very loving and protective of the monks. So it always chased cars outside the monastery like a dog would. But then it was chasing a truck and got run over by the truck and killed. It was the sad part to it. But uh, the monk at the time was meditating and he shouldn't have said this, he actually said he saw what happened next. So the stream of consciousness of this monkey leaving the monkey's body and going into the nearby village where one of the women there was pregnant entered her womb. And this was a, such a really good monk and so he said that yes, that monkey will be reborn in that womb of that woman, they see an arms round every morning. And if you believe that, it was actually true, wouldn't you be interested to see what comes out of that mother's womb? So I wasn't there at the time when the baby was born, but I did ask, what happened? I said, oh yeah, it was born. And that baby, the way they described it was exceptionally hairy. That's all they said. But the reason why the monks should never say such things, that poor kid, the whole, everyone in the village knew he was a monkey before. <laughs> so what chance would he have, you little monkey? Yeah, of course, I was a monkey before, can't blame me. <laughs> so that's where the extra population comes from. There are so many other beings in this world, not, not all human beings. And I always mention at this point, the animal, animals in this world. So many animals have lost their habitat and the number of their species has reduced enormously. Where do they go? Here. Where do UFL fighters come from? Bikies. I'll let you figure out that, but that's the answer. <coughs> okay, anyone here was a monkey before? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so any other questions before we finish? Going, going, gone. Thank you for listening. I had no idea what the talk would be like tonight because at first, Avon Ajahn Bamali saw me at lunchtime today and said, look, are you okay for coming this evening or should I come and you can have a rest instead? But thank you for listening and I hope it was okay. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay.
So I can pay respects to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and then the night is yours. Patipano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami <laughs> 